Welcome back to the discussion of spatial data mining. In last two videos, we looked at the motivation, uh, the example pattern family, a basic definition of spatial data mining. And uh, then we also looked at the input, what does spatial data and relationship look like. Uh, with this, you know, we are now going to get into the statistical foundations. Many of you may have taken a you know, basic course in statistics or used some basic techniques like linear regression and maybe wondering why can't we just use the same statistics for spatial data. And many people still do do that. Okay? But uh, we'll argue that you know, if you're aware of the, you know, the unique properties of spatial data, you can use models which are more customized for this data and can often be more effective. Okay? So after this module, first you know, we should be able to describe this simple concepts in spatial statistics. Concepts like spatial autocorrelation, and you will very soon see why this concept, you know, is a very of a central importance when we mine or analyze spatial data. Uh, we may introduce some other concepts like heterogeneity and edge effect as well. Okay. Now, uh, the spatial autocorrelation has been discussed in many different ways. In spatial statistics, it's discussed in a more quantitative manner using numbers, but in the qualitative or descriptive geography. It has been given the status of first law of geography. So again, you know, at the end of this module, you should know what the first law of geography is and briefly describe it. And essentially, you know, the main point of all this in this video is to discuss the limitations of classical statistics and argue that if you're going to analyze spatial data, you should look at more customized methods from spatial statistics and then consequently spatial data mining. Okay, okay so let's start with the, the you know, the overall picture, why is traditional statistics, you know, not effective for spatial data? So formally, you know, one can go back to one of the key assumptions in traditional statistical method and talk about, you know, whether it's reasonable for geographic data or not, okay? So this assumption is often called IID, okay? So first I stands for independent, the second I stands for identical. So whenever we are given a set of data, for example, is uh, a list of disease location, like cholera death, or crime reports, the classical statistics often will assume that these data samples are independent of each other. Okay, they don't interact. And they came from identical population. Okay. Why did they do that? Okay. A main reason for this was the following. Statistics started almost 400 years ago, and back then there were no computers. So all the calculations had to be done by hand. And as you know, hand calculations can, you know, be tedious and laborious with big data, so they had to keep it simple. And essentially the IID assumption makes life very, very easy, and you can do hand computation. In fact, you know, back in 1600, some of you probably know, when Pearson correlation coefficient was invented in Europe, Britishers, they hired a whole bunch of clerks in Madras, India, and that was their big calculation engine. So they had lots of people who could do this calculation for them. But you know, as you know, human calculations are simple, so they had to simplify the models. So in real world, IID is not often observed, and certainly that is the case with spatial data. And I'm going to show you visual examples and other you know, um, observations to confirm that. Okay? So first thing to notice is that spatial data, when we were looking at the death locations in London, they were not independent of each other. If let's say, you know, if I threw darts at the you know, map of London, they were not going to represent the location of death, right? I mean, these deaths were related, they were all around a water pump, okay? So this is often you know, quantified using this notion called spatial autocorrelation. So if you are not sure whether your data has independence or not, you can go and compute some of these metrics, and these metrics will quantitatively tell you whether that's the case or not. So we will talk about one such function called k function, and given a set of points, it can tell you whether these points are independent of each other, they are spatially random, or they actually interact with each other. And there are other such measures. If you had a raster data, or you know, um, a neighborhood divided data, you might use this other metric. These kind of things can also be used for a computing cross correlation. So if suppose you had looking at two different types of points, locations of McDonald's and locations of say Burger King, 
and you want to ask whether these locations are independent of each other or not, you can use cross k function. Okay? Now, even the second i, the identical distribution, is also you know, challenged in geography. And it's basically used you know, in terms of spatial heterogeneity. So you may have heard um, you know, sayings like the following, no two places on Earth are exactly alike. And that's essentially saying that you know, the Earth place to place things vary. Okay? And this kind of a thinking is very, very common in areas like agriculture or ecology. Okay? If you think about, you, know, you want to bring some new plants to a new region of the world, let's say Florida is trying to grow you know, a new variety of plant, they are not going to simply pick up a plant from Minnesota and say it will well, you know, behave well in Florida. They are going to do a lot of local testing, and to begin with, they will try to pick place, you know, plants from places which have similar climate. Okay, so there is a lot of heterogeneity. So let's take this argument further, and you know, first tell you that um, there has been a lot of intellectual development. So last 30, 40 years, you know, since computers became powerful, this area of spatial statistics has blossomed. And they have come up with many theories, and I'm showing you three names here. We are going to use some ideas from point process theory, which is developed for data sets which look like a set of points. So if you're thinking about locations of trees or locations of crimes, locations of deaths in cholera, you can use this kind of a theory. It has notions like complete spatial randomness, and you can essentially ask whether these points are independent of each other, or they you know, attract each other or repel each other. And they have metrics like k function. There are other theories which you know, we are not going to indulge into, but just to mention, you know, if you were looking at continuous phenomena like rainfall, snow depth, or mining, there are theories from geostatistics and they have methods like variogram or Krieging, which is used for interpolation and also trying to see the distance you know, uh, to which the spatial interactions happen. Okay? And then finally, if you're working with census kind of data or data which has been aggregated over a polygon due to privacy reason or other reasons, you might find yet another set of theory from lattice-based statistics. Okay? All right, so with this, let's go back to spatial autocorrelation. That's one of the core concepts we want you to learn in this video. Okay? So what is spatial autocorrelation? So let me first give you a visual uh, example of that. So here is a map you know, of that wetland, which has been created using this IID assumption. So what we did here, so this is a raster map. So imagine a set of pixels. For each pixel, we have given a color. So blue is low and red is high. But in this map, these colors are generated for a pixel independently of the colors of all other pixels. Okay? And when you look at this map, you can kind of see that it's a very grainy kind of map. You know, it's almost like white noise. You know, if you take your TV and pull out the cable, if there is no signal in your TV, it may look like this. And try to ask yourself, how often do we see maps like this? And you know, chances are you will agree that not, not very often. Okay? Real maps, they look like this. So I'm showing you the real vegetation durability map for the same wetland near Lake Erie. And you notice that you have a lot of large smooth areas. Okay? In other words, nearby things are similar. And one can quantify that as autocorrelation. Okay? So autocorrelation, essentially, you know, whenever you see these long smooth areas, maps like on the right, then it is, you know, intuitively has spatial smoothness or autocorrelation and it's violating the IID assumption because the nearby pixels are similar, they are not independent. Okay? We can quantify it and I'm going to show you K function very soon, which is one way to quantify this for the point data. And also, you know, many other people have observed it. You know, so Tobler made this statement back in late 60s and this is what he said. You know, all things are related, but nearby things are more related than distant things. Okay? All things are related comes from ecology. Okay? And, uh, but this is the geography. It's saying nearby things are more similar than far away things. Okay? So this has been given the stature of first law of geography. In other words, many people who have studied geographic data believe that this is the case. Okay? All right, so let's quantify it and see that, you know, how you can compute it yourself. And we will take just one example called Ripley's K function which works for a point data set. So try to imagine you have a collection of locations of trees or locations of cholera death or, you know, or locations of crime and so on. So given this point, we want to ask whether these points are completely random. They are independent of each other or do they interact. Okay? So here is the basic function called Ripley's K function. It has two parameters. You give it a data set and then you give it h which is a radius or a distance. Okay? 
and it is essentially defined as follows. So first you see this statistical function called expectation okay? and then you see a normalization function based on lambda which is the intensity of the event. Okay? So this expectation, you know, this is the way to understand it. So what we basically do is we take an arbitrary point, okay? this is an arbitrary point and you draw a circle of radius h around this point and then you count how many other points fall in that circle. Okay? So if you were looking at cholera death, imagine drawing a circle around each cholera death location and use the radius h and count how many other points were within that. Okay? Once you have computed that for each point, then you take an average and that's what a statistical expectation is. Now, you know, this particular average, if these points were independent of each other, then they will be proportional to the area of the circle and then the, you know, you can essentially find the density or intensity to normalize it. Okay? So here is a quick plot. So if the points were independent of each other, if it is complete spatial randomness, then the value of k function will be proportional to area of the circle or pi h square. X axis is h, radius of the circle, y axis is k function and it will grow as area of the circle. Okay? You can also do Monte Carlo simulation to put a standard deviation. So there will be a band around area of the circle for complete spatial randomness point. Okay? Now for your own data set, if you want to interpret its value, there are three cases. Okay? So we compare the k function for our data set with k function for complete spatial randomness and you can have three cases. One case, the k function for our data set is very similar to k function for complete spatial randomness. So it may line up exactly on this you know, red line or within the standard deviation band of that. And if that happens, then you can say, well, maybe points, they are very similar to complete spatial randomness. But for real data sets, you know, other things can happen. So here is sort of complete spatial randomness, the left map. And in this case, your k function will track area of the circle. But if your points like each other, they are clustered like this, then you are going to actually see that this k function will be well above this. Your k function will lie in this region. It will be well above what is there for complete spatial randomness. And lo and behold, there is another set of pattern, you know, something like this. So if you see, for example, this pattern in a forest, you can probably tell it's not a natural forest, right? It's man, you know, planted. And in these cases, these points actually are repelling each other. They are as far away from each other as possible. And in which case, your k function will be below the values will be sitting in this region. Okay? So this is one way to test whether you have spatial autocorrelation or not. If you get same value as complete spatial randomness, means the points are independent. If you get higher value, means the points like each other and they are clustered. You get lower value, means the points are repelling each other. You can use similar function to study the interaction between two different set of points. So again, remember the locations of Burger King and McDonald. And if I want to ask whether these two sets of points like each other or not, I can change the function a little bit. So here what we will do is, you know, you put a circle around McDonald and you count Burger Kings, okay? And vice versa. You can put, you know, circle around Burger Kings, count McDonald. And again, if these two sets of points don't interact with each other, it will track, you know, this area of the circle. But if they interact with each other, you will have essentially higher or lower value and that will give you a sense of the interaction between two. And using this, you can actually find, you know, which pairs of things are interacting. So do you remember this pattern family of co-location? And in this, you know, we asked you which pairs of features are co-located and we came up with these two features. So you can verify that using Ripley's cross k function. And if you plotted that for many pairs, this is what you will see. So here is the random pair. If the two point sets were not interacting, you see area of the circle. And you see some pairs are like that, like dry tree and bluebird, their k functions are tracking that. But the two pairs that we thought interacted, like dry tree and fire and house and bluebird, notice their cross k functions are well above the complete spatial random pairs. Okay. okay. So, it, you know, if the spatial autocorrelation is the core concept in this module. If you remember that at the end of this module and course, then the course would have done its job. Uh, but there are other properties. The second main property is heterogeneity. As people say that, you know, what does well in agriculture in Minnesota may not do well in Texas or in Florida and people have to develop their own agricultural practices. And that's a way to think about the modeling. 
if you want to predict ag agricultural successes, probably one should build slightly different models in Minnesota and Texas and Florida, certainly use different features and so on. Okay? So, so here is a way to illustrate why that is the case. You know, if you build only one model for entire Twin City or entire United States, that may not do very well. So here is one data set. It's also called Simpson's paradox and so on. So imagine doing a very simple linear regression kind of model. And you are, have some variable x on x-axis and y on y-axis. If you fit a single line, then this line may look like this. And it may tell you that as x increases, y also increases. But notice that if I separate this data into two groups, the red group and blue group, and you fit separate lines, then the slopes are actually negative. So within red group, as x increases, y decreases. And within blue group, same thing happens. So this is again basically telling you is that if your data doesn't come from a single population, then fitting one model give you incorrect conclusion, certainly weaker conclusion. But if you can divide your data into homogeneous groups like red and blue and fit you know, separate model, one to each group, you will do better. So again, in this case, you can imagine red being Florida, blue being, you know, Minnesota and so on. Okay? There is another issue in spatial data and in terms of statistics called edge effect. So let me al again illustrate it using a simple map. So here is a map, you know, this is from North Korea. And this was given to us by, you know, uh, some of the people who wanted to see the, the power of spatial data mining. So in this map, you know, we were finding anomalous things. So the green and red polygons, they are agricultural fields. And the blue and black lines are transportation, river and road. Okay? The green agricultural uh, fields are those which are easily accessible by transportation. The red ones are not. So one way we define anomaly here are agricultural fields which are not easily accessible by transportation. So you see a red one here, you see some red in the center, some here. But you know, we had more confidence in declaring this, the red polygons in the center to be anomaly. We had much less confidence in declaring the ones on the edge to be anomaly. And again, pause your video for a few seconds here and ask yourself why is that the case? If you have again stared at maps quite a bit, you will come to realize that in fact, no, there is data on the other side which is missing. Okay, this data was given to us for only a region but these edges are artificial. There is data on the other side, just that we don't have it. So it is possible that this red polygon is accessible by a road or river, which is just outside the study area. So in other words, in case of geographic data, the center and edge have specific meaning. And your conclusions are more robust in the center. They are less robust around the edge because you are missing the context around the edge. Okay? So hopefully this gives you a feel for some of the statistical issues like spatial autocorrelation, heterogeneity, and edge effect. So we'll try to wrap up the discussion by quickly telling you that you know spatial statistics has come into its own in last couple of decades. You know they needed a lot of compute power. Spatial statistical models are hard to compute by hand, and that's why they had to wait till computers became powerful enough. But beginning 1980s, you see a lot of growth in that, and now computers are powerful enough for you to enjoy that. There are many theories for point data. You can use point process theory and so on. And this is a live field. It is still growing, particularly areas like spatiotemporal. You know, the theories are still growing. There are some new books that are coming out. And if your data is, again, um, embedded in a street network, like crime reports which have street addresses, the type of statistics is still growing. So it's a live field. More theories are coming in. But you can certainly take advantage of the current theories that are around. And informally, at least three concepts we should carry. Spatial autocorrelation, for sure. And it's easy for you to see even visually when you see things cluster in space or you see smoothness in space, you will see autocorrelation. And if you can go beyond that, then heterogeneity and edge effect may also be interesting. Okay. So with this, we'll wrap up the discussion of spatial statistics. And uh, when we come back, we will start looking at individual pattern families and uh, try to introduce models which take advantage of spatial statistical ideas like autocorrelation.